Sur Science and Service here at NIH. Four people who embody excellent leadership, four people who have the tenacity, the grit, the passion, and the courage to navigate rocky shoals in pursuit of their dreams. And they did so with grace, elegance, and benevolence. The selflessness they exhibit is rarely paralleled. Each has scaled barriers and shattered ceilings while deliberately and methodically building a path forward for the next generation of scientists and administrators at NIH. What they have accomplished is monumental. That they were able to achieve their goals during one of the most storied eras in our great nation's history makes them remarkable. So before I speak to their accomplishments, I want to take a few minutes to place us in the social and political landscape of the civil rights era. I would like to play an excerpt from a speech given by the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to a group of high school students in Cleveland, Ohio in 1967. Crowd with the eloquent poet, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. If I were so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is a standard of the man. So set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to our four NIH trailblazers, Dr. J. Taylor Hardin, Dr. Kenneth Olden, Dr. Vivian W. Pinn, and Dr. Nathan Stinson, Jr. Dr. Hardin began her professional career as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. She was one of the first nurses to apply for and receive a transfer of service to the U.S. Air Force Active Reserve as a flight nurse. She served at Andrews Air Force Base, Castle, Lackland, Mather, McGuire, and Shepard Air Force Bases. She's a Vietnam-era veteran. And as a medical crew director, she completed several patient air evacuation missions. In 1994, she becomes a tenured associate professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And this culminates an academic career that she began in 1977. In 1995, she becomes the first and only faculty member to participate in the competitive NIH Extramural Associates program. From 1994 to 1997, she is a health neuroscience administrator at the National Institute of Nursing Research. From 1997 to 2011, she is a senior scientist at the National Institute on Aging, and she is the first and only nurse to serve as both NIA assistant to the director for special populations and acting deputy director. I'm not going to go through all of her numerous honors, but we did want you to understand the breadth and scope of her achievements. Next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kenneth Olden who from 1991 to 2005 was a director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. He is the first African American to become director of one of the NIH institutes. When he steps down from that position, he returned to his lab at NIHS. He becomes a visiting professor at the Harvard School of Public Health. And in 2008, he goes to New York City and becomes the founding dean of the School of Public Health at CUNY at the City University of New York. From 2012 to 2016, 
He is director of the National Center for Environmental Assessment in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. And here are some of his honors and awards. Next, we have Dr. Vivian W. Pin. In 1967, Dr. Pin is the only African American and the only woman in her class at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. In 1982, she becomes the first African American woman in the United States to chair an academic pathology department. From 1991, to 1994, she is the first full-time director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, an office which she established. From 1994 to 2011, she is the associate director of NIH for Women's Health Research, and in 2011, she's named a senior scientist emerita at the NIH Fogarty International Center. These are some of the numerous honors and awards she has really, uh, received over her career. Next, we have Dr. Nathan Stinson, Jr. And Dr. Stinson began his federal, co federal career with the Public Health Service in 1984, where he was from 1984 to 2004. He comes to NIH in 2007 in what was then the National Center on Minority Health and Health Disparities. It is now the NIMHD, the Institute. From 2008 to 2009, he is the Acting Scientific Director for Intramural Research Programs. From 2010 to 2012, he's the Acting Director of the Division of Extramural Activities and Scientific Programs. From 2012 to 2013, he is the acting director of the Division of Scientific Programs. 2013 to 2014, he's the acting deputy director for strategic scientific planning and program coordination. From 2012 to 2015, he was the director of the Division of Extramural Scientific Programs. And he currently, since 2015, has been the director in the Division of Community Health and Population Science. And I have one extra slide for Dr. Stinson, and that is just, I want to not only acknowledge his, his honors, these are some of them that I selected out, um, but he is, the, his service record here has, has, is rather extraordinary. In 1998, he was part of Vice President Gore's U.S.-Russian Joint Commission on Economic and Technological Cooperation from 89 to 95. He was part of the Public Health Service Disaster Medical Assistance Team, and he served on several missions. And then in, from 1992 to 2005, he was in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, after the mass Haitian refugee immigration. After Hurricane Charlie, he served in the Gulf Coast of Florida. And then in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, he was in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. So suffice it to say, these four individuals on this stage represent excellence and at the highest levels, and we are going to honor them today, and I'm so happy to be able to give them their flowers. I'm going to call my colleague, uh, Kiana Atkins, back to the stage, and she's going to moderate a program so you can hear some words of wisdom from them. And I can just as a personal note say, that they have all had a major influence on my career. I would not be here today without them, and I count myself among, among the many fortunate, uh, historically underrepresented minorities to have benefited from their work and witness. Hello again, good afternoon. Before I start the moderated session, I would also just like to give a special thanks to Dr. Bertagnoli. She could not be with us today. However, she really tried to, and she wished that she could share and be able to welcome and just support. However, again, she was unable, but we still want to thank her for making the things that she did happen happen for us. 
So I'm going to start with the career journeys, your career journeys, and I'm going to ask Dr. Olden to start the panel first, or the questions first, and then we'll move closer and further towards me. So the first question we'd like to know um, is more about your career journeys at NIH. During your tenure, your careers here, what did you find to be the most challenging and the most rewarding? Well, when I interviewed for the position as director for NIHS with Dr. Healy, she asked me what would I make as my number one priority if I was to be selected as director of NIEHS, and I told her two things. First, I would make the institute responsive to the needs of the American people, number one. And number two, my vision of environmental health was, was broader, more expansive than focus on chemical and physical agents in the environment that social determinants of health, in my estimation, were a major part of what we should be doing in NIEHS. And if I was to become director, that social determinants of health would be uh, uh, one of the programs that we would develop. And, and I would say Dr. Healy and Dr. Uh, Dr. Honey and Dr. Uh, uh, Collins, thank you. <laughs> and uh, well, Collins weren't there. Dr. Uh, Barnes uh, all supported that effort. So uh, I, I think uh, it was a joy to introduce social determinants of health into environmental health. Uh, in 1991, uh, David Will Williams at Harvard did a systematic review of the number of papers that were being published in, on social determinants of health that mentioned just those two words. It turns out that there were eight papers at that time. Based on our investments, plus others, and we got the National Academy of Science involved, there are now hundreds of papers on social determinants of health. And there are now discussions to include social determinants of health into precision medicine. In other words, uh, the social endpoints can be identified just as driver mutations can be identified. And so uh, I'm excited and pleased that I'm around to see how after uh, 30 or so years, uh, social determinants of health is now a major part of uh, environmental health. Thank you, Dr. Olden. Dr. Harding. Well, thank you for the question. When I arrived at the National Institute on Aging, I knew I had found a great home. One of the barriers, some of the challenges at that time when I arrived, dealt with this notion of an ism. We all know about sexism. We know about racism. But at that time, and as we continue to this very day, we confront issues around ageism. When I joined the NIA, as I said before, I knew I was at home because these were people who were quite knowledgeable about that particular ism, ageism. And I knew that with that kind of background, they could understand perhaps my background of racism. So as we confronted issues of ageism at the National Institute on Aging, we were able to address a multitude of issues. For older adults, there was still this sense of discrimination, 
just as people like me had confronted? We also had issues for older adults with separation. Again, given my history, definitely understood the challenges and the barriers when one is confronted. And you think about even to this day, older adults without families, they're still somewhat separated when they need care at the end of life. They end up in assisted care facilities, assisted living facilities, and nursing homes, where they're often separated and segregated at times. There's also this issue of discrimination. And unfortunately, it's playing out this very day in our national politics, that ism, ageism is surfacing in our national debate. We really have a real need for the National Institute on Aging as we continue to confront the barriers, not only for age, but for race and for gender. So these were barriers, challenges, if you will, when I arrived. We continue to address these issues today. Thank you, Dr. Hardin. Dr. Stenson? I think one of the biggest uh, challenges has been uh, the uh, NIH culture. Uh, culture is learned, it's shared, it's symbolic, and uh, it's also integrated into the fabric of, uh, you know, society or, organiz or organizations. Uh, it, but it's not static. I mean, it's dynamic. And it's not too long ago that there were topics like minority health, health disparity, social determinants of health that had very little currency, you know, at, uh, at NIH. But some of the things that have happened over the last, you know, three or so years, unfortunately, George Floyd, the COVID-19 pandemic, has really caused a seismic shift, you know, uh, at, at NIH where there's a greater appreciation and understanding of what's really important. Uh, NIH has always been this behemoth of a, a biomedical research, but now there's uh, other types of research that have taken on a, a new significance, you know, uh, in the efforts to improve the health of everyone uh, in the country. Two examples. One is SEAL. Community Engagement Alliance, where COVID-19 hit the world and the director of NIH task, um, Dr. Perez Stable of NIMHD and Dr. Gary Gibbons of NHLBI, to really come up with a full court press to assure that individuals in, dis, this, uh, in disproportionately affected communities had access to testing, uh, for COVID and could participate in the uh, inevitable clinical trials for vaccines and for, for treatments. Um, and then there's COMPASS, Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society, where uh, the NIH Common Fund, which is out of the office of the director, uh, is investing uh, tens of millions of dollars over the next 10 years to provide direct support to community-based organizations, and they decide who their academic partners are. They are the ones that control the, imp the, the implementation of the uh, intervention in their communities. They're the ones that uh, uh, engage directly with NIH as far as the um, uh, progress uh, and improvements that they're, you know, seeing in their communities. There was a time not too long ago I would have bet anything that I would never see anything like that at NIH. That's the change of the culture. Uh, 
there's more that needs to be done for sure. There's no question about that. Uh, but this is a different, you know, this is a different NIH than it was before because there's a greater inclusivity and embracement of wider aspects of uh, research. And ultimately, this will be to the benefit of everyone in this country. Thank you. Recognize that he, of the four of us, is the only one who is still employed at the NIH. But then that kind of opens up the floor a little bit because we can say a bit more about maybe what we're thinking. Uh, although I'm sure he was honest in what he gave in his remarks. But I have to say that when I came in 1991, as Dr. Olmos pointed out, Dr. Healy was the director. And that was really good stead because I had known her since she was a medical student and had actually taught her, which the press had a great job with calling it the old girls network because talked so much about the old boys network. But also because Dr. Olden, I knew he had been head of the Cancer Center at Howard, where I had been chair of pathology before coming here. And in fact, he was the one that helped introduce our testing for breast cancer, our hormone levels for us there. So I knew him from Howard, and knowing he was the first institute director at NIH, uh, he broke a lot of the, the challenges and a lot of the ceilings that, that some of us coming along behind him had to face. So we owe him a debt of gratitude because he came on as director of NIHS, did a bang-up job leading that, uh, no compromises in, in anything, and really sort of set the standards that made it possible for the rest of us to come on and do what we needed to do. Um, I, there was, it was great to have Dr. Healy as the director then because this Office of Research on Women's Health was brand new, and one nice thing was that they had nobody to compare me to because nobody had ever done it before. But it also was a challenge for me because in defining the role and eventually defining what the position description was, it meant I really need to deliver and show something uh, of, of scientific contribution to the NIH to sustain that office. One of my greatest challenges was uh, actually because that office was really first seen as the office to ensure the inclusion of women and of people of, of minorities, as was worded then, in clinical research studies funded by the NIH. And we actually wanted to expand that to not just being a monitoring office, but a policy office and a research office. And we were able to do that with Dr. Healy sort of saying, go for it, because she was interested in women's health and, and allowed us to go forward. She just said, keep her informed. Don't let her be surprised at something by hearing it from a reporter, but to make sure she knew about it. But she was so supportive, and I must say that she also was very supportive of efforts to increase those of us of color, as well as women, in leadership positions at the NIH. And I really enjoyed some of the things that she did. She had meetings with Congressman Stokes. Louis Stokes was on the Hill then, and he would have meetings with her about twice a year. And he, I remember him expressing how pleased he was to see the number of people of color that she now had in her administration when she would bring all of us with her. I remember later institute, uh, later NIH director who was going for that meeting and I sort of asked, am I gonna get to go? And I was told I was not needed. And in fact, those meetings no longer went forward after that. I won't call the name of that director, but I can re recall that vividly. So I have seen, as Nate says, we move forward. We have moved forward quite a bit at NIH, but there's still some areas that historically we sort of see repeat themselves. I have to say, you know, one of the challenges I had for the Office of Research and Women's Health was that it was seen as a policy office. We set up a strategic plan for research, but one of the things that I wanted to do was to make sure when we were addressing women's health that we were addressing the health of all women. And one of the things when we were looking at careers for women that many of our constituents pointed out, which I really knew, and that is that some of the things that might work for, 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 populate, for women in general might not always be helpful for women of color. So I really wanted to set up a special group to look at women of color 
and their careers and what NIH needs to do or should be doing to better enhance and support the development of women of color. So within our Committee on Women in Biomedical Careers, I asked Dr. Taylor Harden if she would chair a subgroup for us on women of color. And I hate to tell you, and I guess this is what the sign of the times was, but this was before I left, so when was that Taylor? That was about, about uh, late 90s, late 90s, about 2000. So when we presented this to the committee, we didn't get discussions of why was this important and why do we need to do that? It was, why are you going to call them people of color? How will they know if they're a person of color or not? And we had this whole meeting was just, went off on a whole, just intact of, of why you're going to label it people of color. Won't that be insulting? And I finally just said, we of color will know we are of color and let's go forward. And Taylor led that and I think that committee has continued and Marie uh, Bernard eventually headed it and I'm not sure if she's still doing that now. But looking at issues for women of color to me was very important to make sure that, that, that there was the diversity, attention to the diversity of women uh, in all of the programs of the Office of Research on Women's Health. I won't go into to more, but I, more things, but I just wanted to point out that what you see before us of each of us have our own careers, we had our own challenges, we had our own ways of dealing with them, but to me, the greatest benefit we had was that we each kind of supported each other. And we looked up to the accomplishments of others and that helped us. And we needed to do the same thing in bringing others on board because if we didn't reach down and help those who were coming to be able to be successful in what they were doing, especially in the early years, that, that I think we would not have the accomplishments that Dr. Simpson has pointed out. But sometimes I wonder how deep those accomplishments go in seeing some of the things. I'm really delighted to see how your institute has really developed research programs, has gotten additional funding. That is coming a long way because I remember, and I'm sure Ken and Taylor remember, when they did not want us to have an institute looking at health disparities or, or so-called minorities. Uh, but there are also little things that still happen uh, at the NIH that I hear about that, that uh, Bother me. And one last thing, I won't go on because I think we've used up so much time on question number one. But one of the things that was most disturbing to me uh, was, and I think I'm seeing Dr. Owens in the audience, I'm sure he can relate to this, that when I first came to NIH, there were a number of people of color, who, especially guys, but guys and gals of color who were scientists, who were in the intramural community, and who were aiming to become tenured. And I saw many of them leave for great academic appointments elsewhere, but I wondered why we couldn't keep them at the NIH. Glad they got the experience and got the credentials of the NIH, but I just thought we'd lost more than we needed to. And I was sort of frustrated because many of them would come. I was new to the campus and I was a little more outspoken because I wasn't worried. I thought if they fire me, I'd look for another job till I realized I was too old, I better watch what I was saying, but in any case. But people would come and talk to me about some of their experiences. And I would try to do what I could to help them. And I know Roland was really involved with a lot of this in those days. And he'll have to speak for himself, but for me, it was very discouraging over the years to not see an actual increase in the numbers of scientists of color who went on to become tenured, uh, tenured faculty here, uh, or tenured scientists here at the NIH. Uh, that was something that was discouraging, but overall, my experiences at NIH were fabulous. I wouldn't have given anything to not have, uh, to, to, have, to have had this opportunity. And I'll stop there. I think I just touched on a bunch of stuff rambling, but that's what happens when you're last and you're oldest. Thank you so much, Dr. Penn. Uh, each of you have definitely contributed to the progress we have currently made and where we are. So we really thank you for that. Um, and it seems that it's been vast, different areas of impact. So as we are thinking of that and how you got to those points within the NIH, we want to transition to the role of the Civil Rights Act because we are 60 years later from that era. And as we think about that, how did, as you transition the civil rights 
era impact you, your journey, and how do you think it opened opportunities for blacks in science and medicine? Dr. Olden. Well, clearly, the, the civil rights uh, movement had a huge impact on uh, a, a, a many programs uh, that benefited us. And I was, uh, uh, at, at that point, uh, in, in graduate school and thinking about a postdoctoral work. And I think, though, that most of the improvements and advancements that were made over the years have institutions did some, uh, but I think most of the change that happened at institutions happened because there was someone there, some bodies there, who were uh, committed to uh, inclusion and diversity. And it was not not so much it was an institutional commitment, but there were individuals who understood what the struggle was all about. And those individuals, as I think back, were the ones that made things happen. When I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship to Harvard uh, in physiology department, uh, the person I wrote to was uh, uh, agreed that I should come. But once I got there, I discovered that uh, the institution had also admitted uh, the first time 20 uh, African-American students in the, school, in the School of Medicine. Uh, now, in physiology department, there ended up being three of us. And it was mostly due to two people in that department. And almost none of the other departments uh, had anyone. There was, so you, I realize that, and that, I think that's still the case today. I look at my friends who are in business and other uh, professions, and you can almost in every case identify an individual who uh, understood the struggles uh, that, uh, and that equal opportunity was, had not been uh, common uh, in America. And so, yes, the, the NIH was important in, in my life. Uh, I had a good, good uh, great opportunities here. But I think it was uh, uh, people like, I can say it's her name, Ruth Kirstein and Al Rapson, uh, 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 Ira Pastan, and others, when I wanted to come to the NIH uh, as, as a senior staff fellow, uh, I wrote to Ira Pastan. I didn't write to the director of the NIH. And Ira Pastan and took me into his laboratory. And after, uh, Three years, uh, he promoted me to tenure with my own resources, and I think that was, I'm pretty sure that was, the first African American to be promoted to tenure as a researcher in the NIH, and that was 1977. So I, I think it, it wouldn't have happened probably without our past plan. Ruth Kirstein and Al Rapson. They are the ones that supported me to get here. And then once I was here, I published two of my most, most cited papers in 1978 that were, became citation classics. Uh, I did what I knew I could do, and they expected me to do. So uh, I, I think, though, in my life, it has been individuals that have made the difference. I hope we'll get to a question. I can speak to my time at the University of Tennessee 
as an undergraduate, and that was the case there as well. It was a person, one person, who really wanted to make a difference. And he went out of his way to make sure that uh, persons, uh, inclusion and diversity was a reality. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Actually, Dr. Olden, you are welcome to continue your story if it is relevant to this. Feel free. Well, uh, I was an undergraduate student at uh, Historical Black College, Knoxville College, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm a Tennessean. Grew up in a rural area. Uh, very poor. Uh, my last year in college, I was, was, had an opportunity to go to the University of Tennessee to do research. And uh, one person made that happen, named Arthur Jones, a Caucasian, Caucasian fellow professor at the university. And he took me, an African-American woman from Knoxville College, into their la his laboratory. And it was, I was going to go to medical school, um, pre-med, senior year. I decided, though, after doing research in his laboratory, I was excited about the work. It was interesting, and I realized that as an African American, I can make a more important contribution as a researcher. So I said, I'm going to become a nationally competitive researcher. And there are a lot of problems that are not being addressed that I can contribute toward. So uh, uh, I made it, so I changed my goals and decided to go. But it was that pivotal, that experience at the University of Tennessee that uh, made all the difference in my life, all the difference in the world in my life. I've enjoyed research, and I've done well in it. And uh, I was happy that uh, to end up as director of an institute here at the NIH. Thank you, Dr. Olden. Dr. Hardin? Before I address the question related to civil rights, I want to just acknowledge another scientist that is currently here at the National Institutes of Health at the National Institute on Aging. Her name is Dr. Cerise Elliott. Dr. Cerise Elliott helped to establish that Women of Color Research Network that continues to go forward, and actually it's in partnership, and I definitely wanted her to be recognized for her efforts that continue to this very day in advancing that network. It was an effort to bring intramural and extramural scientists together for the women that are scientists and the men that care about women that are scientists. If you care, go on the NIH website and look for the Women of Color Research Network, and you will see that there are hundreds of women, thousands, that are connecting across our nation that consume the very products that are produced here at the NIH. So back to the question related to civil rights. So I was in 64, high schooler, large afro, if you can imagine, that was the time in the pop, the, that was the culture. Um, protest was on our mind. Um, had witnessed a lot of the destruction and riots that occurred in this area. Um, native Virginian, grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, product of a high school that at the time was a competitive, it was a magnet school. It didn't have that designation, but it was a magnet school. It was called the William um, McKinley Tech Technological High School. And it was my second exposure to um, teachers that did not look like me. I'd gone to a pretty much segregated and separated middle school with all African-American teachers, but my high school um, was, um, I think, fortunate to have real diversity in the teaching rights, diversity in terms of the science and technology expertise at that high school. 
So I was happy about that. But again, that restlessness in knowing that the Civil Rights Act had been passed in 1964, and you have to understand the history and the fight and the struggle to get that act passed and what it did for our nation and what it did for me was to help control, help to slow some of the obstacles and barriers related to social engineering. By that I mean at the time my country tried, and I'm going to go back to this theme over and over again, discrimination, separation, and segregation. So I said my middle school was predominantly African American and student population and teacher population. That's because we were in a segregated area of the city where mostly people that looked like me lived. It was segregated in terms of when you got on the public transportation buses at the time, didn't have subway then. That was the only way to get to the heart of the city, if you will, the more established part, the part with the more resources. I was mentioning earlier today that even today, there are probably children in the southeast sector of our nation, of this city, the southeast sector of Washington, D.C., that don't know about the National Institutes of Health. They may have ridden by and thought, oh, that looks like a college campus. I've seen that on TV. But they don't really, really know. So what happened with this act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it opened doors of opportunity. And I wear my badge proudly. If you tell me I'm a affirmative action hire, I go, okay, I'll take it because it has led me to where I am today. Call me a diversity hire. Whatever the label is related to that door being open, I walked through that door. I was able to go to a great high school. I was admitted into a university that I probably would not have necessarily been admitted to. Not that I didn't have the grades. But again, remember discrimination, segregation, and separation. So I was admitted to the University of Maryland to the School of Nursing. It's a competitive program. And you would think that with open and fair competition, why was it that in each of the classes before me and even subsequent classes after me, there were only two African Americans. Again, I go back to those issues of discrimination, segregation, and separation. A leader, Mary McLeod Bethune, said, there can be no discrimination, no segregation, and no separation of some of the citizens from the rights that are due to all of us. And I continue to live by that creed, so I'm thankful for the doors that were opened by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And as Mary McLeod Bethune said, we're on our way. And we are. We've made great strides. When you look around and for this person to sit here now and be the first we have to ask, who was the second institute director? Who was the third? But the question I ask to you, do we know who the tenth is? Or is that somebody who's out there waiting to be appointed? Have we had ten diverse directors of institutes? Not centers, I'm talking about institutes here at the National Institutes of Health. So there's more work to be done. And the one thing I am confident of is that here at the National Institutes of Health, people do care. 
we understand as scientists collectively what the problem is. We follow the research process. We know what's stated in the literature. We know a methodology, methodology to help correct some of the problems. But without legislation, without the one, without people who are committed to making a difference, we never necessarily get to execute those solutions that can work to make our nation even greater. So again, I applaud, like Dr. Penn said, I would not be on this stage without her including me in efforts from the Office of Research on Women's Health. Some of those efforts were challenging, and I thank her for those assignments because I grew. I grew in ways that I didn't know was possible. But you never want to disappoint. And I think that's been part of the African American experience for many of us. When we can look around and see those that have mentored us and made a difference in our lives, we don't want to disappoint. We want to continue to push those boundaries forward. And as I said, I'm very grateful for what happened with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Harding. Now we'll move on to Dr. Stinson and then Dr. Penn. Uh, how do I follow that? I'm not so sure uh, anything I said uh, uh, will uh, you know, add to uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what Dr. Harding just said. Um, it's an intriguing question because the Civil Rights Act is, it, it's, it's foundational to all of this. I mean, it really uh, opened up the door um, for opportunities uh, in such a, a very broad scale. Not that it has been easy for anyone to, you know, travel that, you know, particular, you know, pathway. And there are, you know, even to this day, uh, attempts to, 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 to roll things back uh, to a time where there was, uh, you know, unequal uh, tr uh, treatment uh, of individuals uh, in, the, in, in the country. Uh, one, one of my, I'm from Washington, I grew up in Washington, D.C. as, as uh, well, and we chatted about that a little bit, uh, and she may actually uh, know my brother. Um, uh, she's going to look him up in the yearbook. Um, but one of my most vivid memories uh, growing up uh, was my parents being part of a, a, a group um, that met at, at, at each family's home. Um, it was black couples and white couples, and they would, they would alternate meeting uh, at their homes, and they'd talk about race, um, just talk about race. And uh, I remember maybe I was just being a little nosy or just, uh, you know, looking for trouble. I don't know. But from time to time, I'd hide in the, the, the coat closet and listen to, uh, you know, what they were talking about. And as best as I can remember, you know, as being a, you know early teen at that time, uh, there were frank and direct discussions of, about something that today is still seems to be incredibly difficult you know, they have a conversation about. Uh, and, and as Dr. Olden was saying, it just made me, you know, you know, it just reinforced in my mind that change really comes from individuals who will make that change, who are committed to that and will push society or, 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 or push the policies that will allow a beneficial change to, to happen. And I think about the the individuals who at that time formed that group, um, you know, to have the foresight of what was really important or what was something that would help the nation as a whole um, is something that uh, um, is really remarkable in many ways, you know, in, in, in my mind. And, and I, I often think about uh, a... Uh, a quote uh, from um, you know Maya Angelou because I, I think what the Civil Rights Act did is that it really you know changed the landscape to where 
you know, uh, uh, people recognize that no one's better than you and no one's worse than you, you know, and, and so you should have the same opportunities that anyone else has. And she came, I think it was in 2009, she came to NIH, and one of the things that she said I will always remember, she said, equity is like air. It belongs to all of us. I, I think about that all the time because it is so, so true. Thank you, Dr. Stenson. Dr. Penn? Well, I think my colleagues have covered this so well, and I agree with the uh, the major concepts they put forward. When I reflect on the Civil Rights Act and what I, changes I saw before and after, so 1964, I was already in medical school. I started medical school in 63. I was already in medical school in a city that was still segregated, that still was not taking women in its undergraduate uh, uh, university, um, where uh, its city itself was still segregated. In fact, I went to segregated schools all the way through high school until, and this was in Virginia also, but the real Virginia, Southern Virginia, uh, uh, and then uh, until I went to Boston to college, and even though Boston was the North and was supposedly integrated, I don't know how many of you remember what was happening in South Boston uh, where they did not want to integrate the schools and the busing episodes there, so I saw all of that. Um, and then I saw the Civil Rights Act come about. And I think the lesson that I saw from that is what uh, Dr. Olin and Dr. Simpson have already pointed out. The law itself didn't just make everybody all of a sudden change and say the doors are open and we're going to be open and bring in everybody. It actually took an individual here or a couple of individuals there who really took this seriously and who really felt dedicated to the principles of diversity and making those opportunities exist. And you saw it almost every place where there was a great program for minorities coming in, especially for blacks coming in to, to PhD programs, coming in, even pre-med programs are coming, coming into medical school, and you saw the changes. Almost every one of those you could identify one person on the faculty there who really was creating and taking that forward. But it did make a change and because it became part of the law. I could comment on other things, but I think that's been covered pretty much. I don't want to repeat. Everybody else has said, I'm just going to issue a bit of warning. And that is that we should not take what we gained under the Civil Rights Act as established and long and, and permanent. Because you can see what's happening in the political world today. And we need to make sure, just as what happened with the Voting Rights Act, we need to make sure that our, our rights under the Civil Rights Act continue to be recognized and enforced as we go forward so that the young folks coming behind us don't have to fight the same battles. I just seemingly almost every day look at what's in the news and what's happening, and I get very concerned because we're fighting a lot of the same battles, especially as it relates to women's health, as it relates to voting, as it relates to voter suppression, as it relates to being admitted. Uh, to medical and graduate schools, and to me it's like revisiting what it was like in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s before the Civil Rights era. So I just ask that we all remain dedicated to keeping those laws and the principles behind those laws current and give our, our, our every effort to preserving them. And I'll just stop there. Thank you, Dr. Penn. Such wonderful and inspiring information, um, your history, your stories, and the, I will say, journey, I will just say your journey, I'm thinking for a different word, but your journeys, they are inspiring. And so, as we look forward and move to the future, and where we are now with black scientists, at aspiring scientists, aspiring blacks who face in public health. What advice, if any, could you give them as they journey through their careers and their pathway? Dr. Olden? Oh, Dr. Penn, go ahead. <laughs> okay.
There are a lot of efforts underway. For one thing, I'm on a, a round table at the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine that's dedicated to increasing opportunities for, for women. It was supposedly really started out with black men, but I couldn't be there and not address women also. So it's really a round table addressing uh, the uh, improving opportunities for black women and black men in science, engineering, and medicine. And so we've been having a series of meetings and programs over the past, I think we've been in existence now a little over three years, after it became obvious that we were not, that the numbers of black men in medicine had remained stagnant since the 70s. And so we had not been increasing. While we were increasing blacks in medicine, was mostly related to taking more women in. And that looked great until you stopped and saw what's happening to our male colleagues and our male students, and they were not getting the same opportunities. So there's been a lot of attention given to that and looking at the barriers that students face along the pathways. Um, I won't go into all the barriers because they are there. One of the major ones is looking at institutional racism and that we really need to eliminate racism as it exists throughout institutions. By that I mean whether the institution is a university, an organization, or, or, or school, um, but just that we shouldn't always think that we have to change to fit into the system. Maybe the system needs to adapt to having more diverse participants in that system, uh, and that's where we think the, 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 the efforts need to go. Um, but, but to not go further into that, if there's time, I'd love to tell you more about that. And also that the National Medical Association also has an effort undergoing with the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, uh, addressing the same issue, uh, really looking at increasing black men uh, in medicine and science. And I think we need to look beyond just medicine, but looking at careers in science in general. Not everybody needs to be a doctor. Uh, there are other roles that you can have in, this, uh, in, in science and medicine. Um, but it's, 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 to me, is pleasing to see that there are actually organizational efforts like having the AAMC, which has never been successful in reaching parity for blacks in, 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 in admitted to medical school and graduating, that they're at least focusing on that. And then it is something of a first for the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, many of you may know it, as it used to be called the Institute of Medicine, to have an actual roundtable addressing these specific issues. The only problem is that you can only come up with suggestions and thoughts. It does not have a power of, of uh, implementation. And so that's where our effort is. We come up with great ideas and great thoughts, but we need to make sure that institutions are paying attention. But the final thing is because the question really was not that. I just wanted to point out there's some groups that are really looking at what advice we can better give and how we can make institutions more receptive. Uh, but I would say to anyone aspiring to careers in science and medicine to go for it. I think there's nothing more fascinating, nothing more fulfilling than knowing that you're making a difference. You're discovering something from science that no one knew before, or you're beginning to understand more about the body or the environment or our climate or whatever, that you have a better understanding to embrace that and what we can do to, in, in, to improve and to preserve it for future generations. Uh, and you just look at our climate uh, as an example. And that there will be challenges along the way, and boy, I could recount some challenges. And sometimes I think when I hear students complain about some of the microaggressions that they face and comments that they're called and names they're called, and I'm thinking, gee whiz, what would you have done if you'd been coming through when I was coming through 50 years ago and some of the things we were called and how we were addressed? And then I stop and think, no, that's not fair. Because 50 years later, even if we did endure those things 50 years ago, students today should not be having to face those same challenges if we'd made any progress. So my word of advice is go for it, be interested, and don't let all these distractions and, and, and challenges and isms, be they racism, sexism, homophobism, all those isms, don't let them take you, distract you from your purpose. Remember what you're, what you're striving for 
And yes, you try to combat those things. Don't let these issues totally take you over, but at the same time, don't let them distract you from what you're there for. So I guess that's my, my bottom line. And, and always know that you can do better than those folks who think that you can't do as well. That's the end of my message on this one. Nate, to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stinson. Two pieces of advice. Uh, first one, uh, which uh, uh, aligns with what Dr. Penn just said, uh, understand what your goal is. A, a goal is what you want to be or what you want to achieve. And don't shortchange yourself. Um, uh, too often, I think, I think there is a tendency to try to decide what's achievable. You know, well, what, what is it so I can say that I was successful because I met that? And that may not be really what you as aspire to. Uh, there is nothing wrong with aspiring to the most lofty, you know, level or position. Uh, and getting close is not failure. Uh, that may be very far from, you know, setting some type of goal uh, that uh, you can easily, uh, easily achieve. So don't short, you know, uh, you change yourself. You never know exactly what you're able to uh, actually uh, accomplish. The second uh, piece of advice is find that special mentor. And, and that mentor doesn't have to be, you know, in the scientific, you know, area. And what I mean by, quote, special is to find that person that sees something in you that you don't even recognize. Um, for me, uh, I wasn't one of those uh, individuals who wanted to be a scientist uh, from third grade or participated in you know, school science affairs. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, my first year of college, I spent more time in the student union game room than I did in the library. Uh, and I have such a vivid memory of, you know, English class and uh, the professor coming up to me at the end of a class saying that he wanted me to come to his office hours. And I said, oh, okay, uh, all right. But I was perplexed because I wasn't doing bad in the class. I mean, I was passing, let me say it that way. Uh, I wasn't falling asleep in the class. I wasn't disrupted in the class. And I had no idea what he really wanted to talk to me about. And when I went in to see him, what he said to me is that, I just have a feeling or a sense you're not working to your potential. And Roy Lutke is his name. I will never forget this man who essentially, you know, uh, was more concerned about me than I was about myself at that point in time. And uh, it really was transformational because I had to step back. It forced me to step back and think, well, what is it that I really want to do? Why am I in college? What is it that I think I can actually, you know, uh, uh, achieve and, uh, and and accomplish? And so during the you know rest of the the time during you know during his life, he was someone that that I could have a conversation with that had nothing to do with biology or science, but but someone who I feel was the foundational mentor for me that helped me think about what was important to me and to use that to determine what my goals, uh, goals were. Thank you so much, Dr. Stinson, Dr. Hardin. This is for my mentees that are present, such as Beverly. It's for my colleagues from the NIA that are present. And it's for my mentees that are online. They told me they would be listening. So they know when we talk about aspiring scientists, um, those that are already in the scientific domain, this is for you and for all of you as well. Do we have any football fans here? Can you raise your hand so I can see? I'm new to football, but it's my new thing. And the reason it's my new thing is I think of science and aspirations being on a football field. 
think about the current Super Bowl champs. You have a team. We didn't get to team science here at the NIH as if it was something new. Team sports had already been out there. And the reason you have a good team is because you want to get to the goal line. The goal line is whatever scientific question you're exploring. You want to solve that thing. That's your goal. And you want to recruit the best people around you, the best people in the world. That has been the legacy of the team science and team sports. You can send an email to anyone. And most people, they love giving free advice. It's up to you to be able to screen that. Now, the other thing, so as not to take up too much time, but you have that football analogy in mind. You know the lay of the field. What you have to keep in mind as players is that we're in the era now of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and some add the A for accessibility. Don't forget where you came from when you started playing football. So don't forget about the discrimination, the segregation, and the separation. You have to keep that in mind because just like a team, sometimes they'll try to block your vision, your view, and have you forget where you came from, what you learned in the past. So don't ever lose sight of that. The other thing is as a player, I want you to be conscientious, a certain persistence and dedication to your craft. In psychology, they say conscientiousness is indeed a trait. I also believe you can learn some of those behaviors. It is that dedication and that persistence. I want you as a player in this game of science to ask questions. And it is true. There is no stupid question. The only stupid question is the one that doesn't get asked. So become a connoisseur of how to formulate the question, how to execute the question. And when you're coming up with your research questions for exploration, always consider who is included, who is excluded. That's what we're about today, because we've had so many research questions asked and answered, but there wasn't anyone else out there at the time necessarily asking. So if we explore that question, when we answer it, is it like air? Is it equitable? Who's included? Who's excluded? I also want you to learn to write better. Do you think the quarterbacks in the Super Bowl just started lobbing the ball? No, they had coaches. Wake up. If we have a problem, the one thing we can always do is lob a good manuscript at it. And I want you to be able to write well. So if you write well now, I want you to practice, I want you to study, I want you to be coached, to be exceptional in your writing. It's becoming a lost art. People are barely reading. And you know, as a scientist, we know how to read. But we also must write. Our currency remains publications and presentations. So think about the quarterback. They practice lobbing the ball, practice writing those manuscripts, keep them out there, get it over the goal line, make a difference in the problems that we have decided to address in our own particular area of the interest. Two more, learn to withstand criticism. It's another ism. You're going to get criticized. 
Hello, welcome to life. Everybody in here, right? We've gotten criticism. Some of my ideas, they said, oh, we can't do it now. We don't have the money, Taylor. When are we going to get more money? In the next budget cycle? So I should wait another year? No, we need to do certain things now. Now is the appointed time. The last thing that I want to say to you, many of us have been socialized over time to think about our careers as a ladder, progressing up and up and up. What I've learned here at the NIH, your career is more like a jungle gym. You can move sideways, there are lateral moves. If you don't like where you are now, I think you have a few other institutes that you can explore to find the right place for you, the right fit. You can go to the top, you can stand on the top bars and survey the land around, or you can turn that thing all the way upside down on the jungle gym. So don't think everything has to be lopsided and going up and up in your career. It's the jungle gym. You could go to the other side of the jungle gym and gain a whole new perspective. Bottom line, be flexible and never feel boxed in. Your career is much more expansive than just a simple ladder. You have the entire jungle gym of science to explore. Good luck to you aspiring scientist. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Hardin. We're going to stop or end with Dr. Olden on this question, and then we're going to transfer into audience Q&A. So if anyone has a question, you're able to, if you're in the room, come to the mics. And if you're online, you can put your question in the chat. Dr. Olden, please excuse me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I grew up in extreme poverty in Tennessee on a farm or on the son of a sharecropper. And sharecropping, you know what that is. And the first thing I had to do was decide that I was going to be somebody. That was a critical decision. In other words, I was not going to become what was expected of me based on the, the circumstances of my birth and upbringing. In order to make that a reality, it required determination. And I think making a decision that you're going to be a player first and you're going to have the determination to succeed, you're not going to allow anybody, anything, to pre prevent you from achieving your goal. And then you have to focus on what it is you have control over. What you think of me, do you like me, it doesn't matter. There are things that you can control. The amount of knowledge that you have about a subject matter, your competence, you can control. When I went to high school, we were bused from the rural area into an urban area, and the perception of the people from the rural area was that we were ignorant and dumb. Well, I accepted one of those, and that is we were ignorant. We had not had a good education, but I felt that as all the knowledge that the other kids had was available to me. I just had to catch up. It was available. It was out there. So I worked hard enough to catch up and maybe pass a few of them, if not most of them. But it was determination. And then the final thing I would say is be proactive and aggressive in seeking mentors. None of the mentors I had did they voluntarily come to me and say, Ken, can I help you? I was aggressive, and I would go up to them as an uh, African-American male in national meetings to professors, uh, distinguished professors, three of them at Harvard that were 
my strong mentors, and I would meet them, our people at meetings, and say, hello, I'm Ken Olden. I work on so-and-so and so-and-so, and and I'm interested in. When I began to do that at national meetings, uh, they would be startled, first of all. But after I'd, I went up to the same person meeting after meeting, you know, year after year, they would say, oh, hi, Ken, how are you doing? So when I needed a favor, when I needed somebody who would clout to write a letter or make a phone call for me, they could do that. So after being at Harvard four and a half years in physiology and biochemistry, I wanted to come to NCI, National Cancer Institute, to work with our pastor. I walked up and, and talked to a, a professor named Bernard Davis, famous microbial physiology, and asked Dr. Davis, would he write a letter for me to Dr. Pastan? Dr. Davis was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. The other person who wrote the other letter was also Dr. Eugene Kennedy, also a National Academy of Science member. And Ira Pastan is a National Academy of Science member. I knew them well enough to ask for a letter. And they were happy to write a letter, support my application wherever I was going, because they knew me. Over the years, I stopped them in the hallway and talked to them them about my research, research, so they knew that I was serious about science and I knew what, knew science, that was. So, there are people in this room, I guess I shouldn't say, that I've mentored, and I remember she approached me in a hallway many years ago when I was at CUNY as founding dean of the School of Public Health to introduce herself. I am not a fan of group mentoring. In other words, there are groups, cr- groups and who go in and bring in 15 kids and talk to them about do this, do that. My mentoring, I am on, I have two stars, they've done well, but they, both of them came to me. And I'll tell you this one story and I'll end about mentoring. A young lady who was a student at uh, Sidwell France here in D.C., which is uh, where Barack Obama's daughters went to, I believe. Uh, She came to me uh, first the second year that I was director, scientific director at that point, of the Cancer Center at Howard. She came to me, a young black woman, and asked me if she could come and work in my laboratory. And I was, uh, as I am now, a grumpy old man, And uh, I had everybody in my laboratory. I didn't have space for her. I didn't have time for her. So I tried to put her off, but she wouldn't allow me to. Thank goodness she didn't. So I sat down with her that day and talked with her. And I brought her, and she convinced me that she was worth investing in. She worked with me two or three summers. She got admitted to Yale University. I got her admitted, I told, her, she should work in a friend's laboratory, Jim Jameson's laboratory, who's a, if not Academy member, I guess he is. She worked in his laboratory. Then I told her to come to Ira Paston's lab. I said to her, when I write a letter, people will, you're African American, I'm an African American, we need someone else. She did that. Then when she finished medical school, she went to work with Lance Leota here in pathology. She is now a full professor in pathology at MD Anderson. That's the kind of mentoring that matters. When I can do, pick up the phone and say absolutely and unequivocally, this is a person that I would invest. You cannot go wrong. You don't have to be long. That's all you need to say. And that works. So be aggressive. Make people know who you are and that you are serious about science or whatever profession you're interested in going in. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Olden. At this time, we have a question from our online audience. So we're going to pivot. Can you all hear me? First, thank you all for being here. It's our honor and privilege to host you today. I have a question from an atten a virtual attendee. What if any assistance or evolution do any trailblazers speak into health demographics of minorities, minority communities being impacted by corporations that move in with outdated technology in engineering where disparities with cancer become more prevalent? Could you repeat that question, please? Um, maybe just the last part, just to make sure we are clear. Yes. Thank you. So um, I think the question was asking our trailblazers to speak on, on um, health demographics. And let me just read it. What if any assistance or evolution, do any trailblazers speak into health demographics of minority communities being impacted by corporations that move in with outdated technology in engineering where disparities with cancer become more prevalent? Well, I am a cancer researcher and headed a cancer center, so I will comment. And being director of NIEHS, I should be able to say something about that. Well. When I signed on as director of NIEHS and before that, 1991, uh, I was fortunate. There were two major uh, uh, issues uh, that was on the national scene. One was uh, isolating the human genome, cloning the human genome, and the other was environmental justice movement was current. Uh, and, and environmental justice basically means that uh, uh, that racial and ethnic minorities live in, in, in environments that are disproportionately uh, impacted by uh, uh, industrial pollution and, and uh, chem toxic chemicals. And as a consequence of that, these populations have more dis disability, disability and, and mortality uh, resulting, such as cancer, resultant from those exposures. Uh, so, it, if, if an outdated technology itself, in and of itself, is not toxic, it causes nothing. There are a lot of outdated technologies that are, uh, uh, are, are probably without harm, except on the economy, economics of that company. But there are other uh, uh, chemical uh, or technologies that do impact the community and lead to uh, 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 disparities in health. Uh, so it, it depends on uh, 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 what the technology is and what the control to, uh, that exists to prevent the health, uh, negative health impacts. So that's, as stated, it, it's not, I can't comment but beyond that. Thank you so much, Dr. Olden. Would anyone else like to, or we can move to the next question? Okay, let's move to the next question. What advice would you give to someone like me who has recently began a, a career at the NIH and is facing some of the same struggles related to race and gender that you faced? Could you repeat the question? Happy to. What advice would you give to someone like me who has recently begun a career at the NIH and is facing some of the same struggles related to race and gender that you faced? So I'll take a stab at that. Race and gender are issues that you will probably have all of your life. 
whatever gender you are, you are that gender, and whatever race you are, haven't been able to change that. So you're going to be that race. So let's kind of raise our sights a little bit. Remember my analogy of the football field. I assume that, and I know what assumptions mean, so you don't have to tell me that, but you're here at the NIH. I believe you're here for a reason, that you have something to consider and something to accomplish. Think about the goal. Why did you come here? Do you still think this is a place where you can reach that goal? If so, remember my advice regarding criticism. You're going to always be criticized. So we're going to get over that and move around it. Not ignoring it, not saying it doesn't hurt. But you learn to deal with the criticism. How do you learn to deal with that? You learn by, here at the NIH, you learn by giving factual responses. Equip yourself with appropriate background and data and stand strong. Again, in football, I don't know if you're familiar with this strategy where sometimes a team will try to get you to jump off sides so you get penalized. That's the same thing that can happen to women and minorities. Dr. Penn mentioned the microaggressions. They can make you jump off side. When you jump off side, you get penalized. Don't jump. I'm encouraging you today to stand firm. Be committed to the science that you came here to do. Surround yourself with mentors that will help you. And you have four people here in front of you. I know you may not know how to get in touch with me, but there's Dr. Beverly Watkins here at the NIH. She knows how to reach each of us. And I guess I make this outreach to you today. If you need some support, you need somebody to listen, you need some guidance, I'm your coach on the sideline. Come to me. I'm ready to help play this game of science with you. Hang in there. We're here for you. Thank you, Dr. Harding. We have a question in the audience. Okay, so this works. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for your time and your expertise and your wisdom. This, this is just amazing. So, and I love the football analogy. So um, laying the foundation for my question. Uh, so team science. So we got the scientific part, scientific players, and then I represent the other aspect of the teams, which is the program. And we know, everybody knows, in health research in general, the football field is laid on what? Funding. So the space that I work in, which leads up to the question, is I currently work within the NIH space to engage minority-serving institutions. Right now, specifically, we're, we're focused on strengthening a partnership with Howard University. But in general, as a program person, I have um, a question about any uh, wisdom or strategies you may have on the NI for NIH people who are in the program space that can help strengthen and engage our minority serving institutions. Because as we all know here, um, our minority serving institutions in our HBCUs lack, often lack the infrastructure and just the resources. You know, they're in a whole different space. And so we're working from the NIH to say, hey, you know, we have funding opportunities, but we just need some more wisdom around strategies to engage and really penetrate within those organizations so that they can rise up and get the funding to do the research. Because as, as you all know, working with the minority serving institutions and HBCUs is so important to health disparities because they need to have um, equal opportunity to get the infrastructure funding to do the research. So that's my question. Any, and I know that's a big question, and I'll take you up on the mentorship offer so we can build up. But just at a very high level, any strategies that you have for engaging and working with HBCUs and minority serving institutions so that they rise up to the call to actually apply for funding to do their research? Yeah. 
Uh, sure, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, there's, a, there's really a, a window of opportunity right now um, regarding the engagement of minority serving uh, institutions. Uh, there's uh, much more interest, you know, in really supporting uh, the, the infrastructure and the capacity uh, out there in communities. As I mentioned earlier, this whole area of community-engaged research is really, really having a tailwind right now uh, throughout, you know, uh, many of the institutes at, at NIH. There's also a recognition is that, you know, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to have certain capacity to be able to do that. And so there, there are several uh, initiatives that are going on right now very big one having to do uh, with the uh, Office of Data Science Strategy to help build the, the uh, data science capacity uh, in uh, uh, HBCUs and other minority serving uh, institutions. They've made investments over the last several years to Howard University, uh, Morehouse, and other institutions as, as well. Um, and so I, I, as, as we think through how do we implement interventions out there in communities, who are the logical partners uh, in that type of research? And what is it going to take to be able to, to implement an intervention that's actually going to, to, to have a change uh, out there in, in the communities? And these, these organizations have been completely underfunded historically, have been neglected and overlooked historically, um, but now they're starting to be, starting. I'm not going to overpromise. I'm going to underpromise and overdeliver, hopefully. <laughs> but but uh, that, uh, that, that they are a very valuable asset in what NIH is really trying to, you know, uh, accomplish. And so uh, what I would say to you very, very specifically is that there are several in, in, uh, institutes right now, you know, who are focusing a, a lot of time, effort, and resources towards that, NIMHD, NHLBI, uh, and uh, we need to develop some type of, of comprehensive and thoughtful strategy uh, to really build that capacity. So please feel free to reach out to me whenever you can and uh, be part of the discussions that are going on right now. Thank you, Dr. Stinson. We also have another question from an audience member. Well, could, could I oh. add to that uh, response? I would caution, however, that you require and make certain that, have, that the minority serving institution produces a product and they're serious about the partnership. Having uh, been at Howard University for 11 and a half years, and Dr. Penn uh, could if you elaborate on this, uh, haven't she has been there as well? There, all minority institutions aren't the same. And some, uh, you can put money, you, you need more than money. You have to have a person on that end, the other end, that's committed to producing the product that you're paying for, buying it with taxpayer dollars. And so you need to insist that you are going to get the product or a serious effort to develop that product before you invest. Thank you so much, Dr. Olden. We have a question on the floor. Thank you so much for all of the knowledge and advice and your stories that you shared today. I am Mia Rochelle Loudon, and I work at the NIH, and I'm part of the UNITE initiative for ending structural racism. And one of the things that has come out of that initiative is the recognition project, where we've changed some of the art on the walls to better reflect the broad range of diversity of people who work at the NIH. But I have found it's hard to understand more of the history. Looking back before 2020, before the United Initiative began to understand all the wonderful contributions many different employees of color, not just scientists, have made to the NIH. And so I'm wondering if you have advice for how NIH can do better 
to show the impact that employees have had over the history of the agency. Because as I listen to your stories today, it's in a wonderful tradition of oral history and passing it down that way. But not everyone could make it today to hear some of these stories. So what are ways that we can showcase your stories and others in a way that will be more lasting and be able to reach even more people? Well, one thing that we could do, and I'm doing that, uh, provide in my papers, I'm writing my own memoir in a way, and, and the national, the NIH is, has an archive, and they've asked me for them, and they've been down, and so I'm going to put my papers, my communications, my thinking about issues, uh, programs that we develop, why we develop them, and, uh, uh, and p kids can read them a uh, hundred years from now, I hope. And my grandchildren and children will go in and read them. So I, I think that's all of us could do that. There is an archive here, and they will take your papers and make them available for research. And so that's, that's very important. And so I, in my case, I'm sitting down and literally taking a case and writing it up. I can say that uh, listening about uh, what's going on with uh, uh, community-based participatory research. Well, uh, that was a major investment that we made in 1991. Yeah. And we're recognized for that uh, by uh, Research America. And uh, so I make sure that we don't forget that. Write it up and put a folder in your archive so that people know where these concepts started. Who, who developed them? Or else you will, I, 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 yeah. So you have to do that. Otherwise, I read now things that I know how they got started. But when you read the, the, the press, you might not believe that. So somebody has to set the story record right and say, this started on this day this time, and this is how, these were the players, uh, and, and they can find out if it's right or wrong. It's history. Dr. Oldham, thank you for your comments, and you're right, and I'm concerned because you spoke about Dr. Kirstein and Dr. Rapsich, and they were very much impressing on everyone around them at that time the importance of archives and of of maintaining, and in fact, they were, at that point, you were supposed to have a log of every phone call that came into the office, everything you did, you didn't put in the trash, it went into archives so it could be saved for future reference. And I just, over the 30 years I've been here, it just seems to be there are people who just don't even grasp that anymore, and I worry about what's been lost and what's being lost. And I, was, I, I think I understood the essence of your question. If not, I'm going to answer what I thank you, what I wanted you to ask. Uh, but I, I, it, it really disturbs me to see things that were done and addressed 20, 30 years ago, and then all of a sudden they're like new issues. We should be building on what we've done instead of coming up with new issues. The importance of including diverse populations in clinical trials during the, during the, the COVID pandemic. When we first implemented the, the requirements for inclusion, that was really part of the NIH Revitalization Act of 1994. We covered that, and we have reports addressing that. And then all of a sudden, within the last couple of years, people are raising questions. How do you recruit minorities into clinical trials? And I just said, look at this report, because we covered all that. I mean, just look, it's all outlined, how you do it, what has been successful. But I think, and so I'm re I really get concerned and in fact, I've said now, I won't even go be on the panel because I said, I spoke so much about that 20 years ago, I refuse to come and talk about it again because, you know, what has happened with not recognizing our history is though we never did it before. I think part of that's lost, and kids write, it needs to be written up, but there needs to be access to that information. And I know some of the reports, for example, that we did on some of the issues that I see are being addressed again today. They're not on the website. They're lost somewhere because they're not meeting the standards for what 
has what it has to be to be posted on the website. And I really get concerned because I think we're losing a lot of information because people now don't want to hear, they want to be able to go to the website and pull it out. So I think not only it's important to preserve what we've done, but to make sure that, that what past history has brought us is accessible and people can, can have access to it. Today that really means more going through the web, uh, but that, that we recognize that and then build. I just get very stressed with seeing people repeating and asking the questions that we repeated, that we asked 20, 30 years ago. Did we just do it all in vain? That gets very frustrating for me. That may not be what you asked, but that's sort of a comment that I really feel co comfortable making, so. Dr. Mia Loudon, I'm really glad that you asked that question. And I guess my response to you is, remember loading up the football and getting ready to lob it. I need you to write. That's what I need you to do. As everyone has indicated, we cannot let our history fade and go into the night quietly. If we are not invested in documenting what has transpired in your time, in the efforts that you've put forward, let's document that. Get it into a manuscript. We don't have to wait for the archives until you amass this long career. We, there's a publication or journal out there that will take the history as you can write it now. We had established something at the time, DEI was special populations, so we had a special populations research forum. I don't know if that's still going on. It's still going on. Yay. Let's, let's get that group. Rather than just meeting and having the invited speakers, let's take that hour or so, hour, hour and a half. Work on the next publication. Invite me back. I can make it over from Virginia. I'd love to sit in and see what you all are up to. You'll make a difference. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Our program is coming to a close. I have one more question from online and we have one question in the room. I will just state that the program does end at two for our online audience if you have to leave, but we will continue with the program to make sure that we answer or ask the questions in the audience. So, online. Can you each tell us about your greatest challenges and how you overcame them? Could you each tell us about your personal challenges and how you overcame them? Well, I, I said my greatest challenge was obviously growing up in a rural area with uh, poor education, poor schools, and poverty. Those are, those are two things that are really devastating, and it is not easy to overcome. Uh, but in a minute, what I did is made a decision that I was not going to be a sharecropper, first of all. That meant that I had to transform my life, and I was determined to transform my life. So while I did my farm work my, with my dad, I then... Uh, uh, get to the library, read, read everything that I could find, books, read and read and read so that I could get into college. And then when I got into college, I worked like hell to make sure that I had good grades so I could go to graduate school, I thought to medical school, and ultimately to, to graduate school to get a PhD in cell and molecular biology. So you, 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 uh, there is no substitute for hard work, not that I enjoyed it, uh, but the point is I was determined to be what I wanted to be in life, and I was not going to allow my circumstances to dictate what I was going to be. So just that's basically what I have to say. Thank you. Would anyone else like to answer this question? Dr. 
I've summarized most of my barriers in science, and it goes back to discrimination, people outside of me responding to me in a certain way, seeing my differences in making inferences about those differences, usually in a negative con connotation. Um, separation, again, when you're on one side of the city and you don't even know what lies on the other side of the city. Because we had barriers and we were separated, lack of transportation, lack of resources, poverty, all of that. And the segregation, our libraries weren't as well funded. So again, my thing, the DSS, discrimination, segregation, and separation were barriers. How did I overcome? And that's the more important part. Family support to push forward toward a goal being conscientious. I was always a curious child and a curious adult and will rattle off a number of questions. So the way to overcome is to know what your barriers or obstacles are. And then with the resources we have in this day and age, it doesn't take much to figure out some of the solutions, but inherently the solution is always learn learn, learn, and then learn to execute the plan that you come up with to overcome the barriers. Because there's always going to be another barrier as you go forward. Thank you. Dr. Spencer? Yeah. Could, could, could I just say one thing else? I paid Shine Shoes for 15 cent per pair and, and saved enough money to pay my college tuition year one. That's commitment. I didn't buy a car with my money. I saved it and to pay my first year college tuition. My parent didn't have one red penny to contribute and never did to my college tuition. So either I was going to college on my own or I wasn't going. I went. Yeah, I would just say uh, very uh, succinctly, uh, you know, my biggest challenge was to really determine what opportunities were available to me. Uh, you know, information is always uh, is key, and sometimes um, some people have information, other people don't have uh, information. And so persistence, I, I think, is, is something that's very, very important, and, and it goes back to what I mentioned before, understanding what your goal is. Uh, and uh, taking the steps to assure that you meet that, that goal. And for me, persistence was one of those things. Sometimes when I'm talking as you get older, you don't mind showing those pictures that I used to hide of those old family pictures. And now sometimes when I'm speaking and talking about opportunities, I show a picture of me as a bald-headed baby in my mother's arms with her mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandma Lizzie, who was a descendant of slaves, taken when I was a baby on the farm in Halifax, Virginia, where I was born. No running water, no electricity, uh, but we were happy and we were comfortable. We really didn't think of ourselves as being poor because education was the important thing. And I showed that picture of me as a, I wouldn't have shown it 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Now I don't care if you see this little bald-headed baby, but I show it to say, if I could go from this little farm, this little bald-headed baby on the farm, to the paths and the positions and the travels that I've had, then anybody should be able to do it. And just it's a matter of knowing what's important. Uh, it was a matter of knowing to read, to keep up with your lessons. Remember, I went through totally segregated schools, and so, but the teachers nourished us, and you you. You may not have had the equipment in the labs that others had, but you had more of the nourishment uh, of, of, the, of teachers who knew you and knew your families and your community. And again, it comes back to what I said before, and which Nate and others have pointed out. You've got to, and some say you can only be what you see, but I hadn't really seen a woman physician, so I didn't know, but somehow that just impressed me as something I wanted to do. So I think if you were, a little advanced that and you know you want to be in science or medicine, you want to accomplish something, 
Just keep your eye on the prize and what you want to do and go for it. And as I think is a Ken or a Taylor or somebody's already said, you know, reach for the stars because if you don't go for what is the best or what you're not sure you can attain, then you'll never know what you might have missed. I never would have dreamed coming up in Halifax or Lynchburg that I would be sitting on this stage at NIH giving you advice about my career. Uh, but it's just, you know, I, I was not afraid to go for new opportunities. And the, many of them came through. Some didn't, some did. So my advice is, you know, just be, think about how fortunate you are to even be considering careers in science and medicine. And, and just go for it and give it your all. And again, as I said before, don't let those distractions take your mind and your purpose away from you. And I think I've repeated that over and over, but I really feel strongly about that. Just remember the bald-headed baby on the farm, and then here I am on covers of magazines and things. Who would ever have thought? I'm truly humbled by each and every one of you. I'm, I'm trying not to cry because I'm a little emotional, but to share the air with you all to me is just priceless. At this point, we're going to have our last question in the audience, and we are then going to close out our program. Well, this is not a question. I just want to say Dr. Penn, Dr. Stinson, Dr. Hardin, and Dr. Olden, thank you. Um, I came here today to, I manage the interpreting services program, and I came here to observe, and I had no idea what a treat I was in for to be able to hear your wonderful stories and all that you've done to make the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think those were wonderful sentiments to end our program with. Thank you so much for that. And so, as we conclude, 60 years later, honoring black trailblazers in health and science, we are so grateful for the privilege of sharing in the remarkable journeys of Dr. Vivian Penn, Dr. Nathan Stinson, Dr. Kenneth Olden, and Dr. J. Taylor Harding. This event has been a timeless celebration of excellence and resilience and the enduring impact of trailblazers who have shaped the landscape of health and science. Their stories resonate not just in the context of the past six decades, but as beacons guiding us towards a future where the pursuit of knowledge is marked by diversity, inclusion, and continued excellence. As we carry forward the lessons learned and the inspiration gained, let us collectively commit ourselves to fostering an environment where black excellence and excellence in all forms continues to flourish. I'm going to interrupt because the thing that Dr. Harding and I believe Dr. Olden said that really resonated with me is that equity is air. So everyone deserves equity and we all have excellence. Today we are celebrating black excellence, but Everyone has the opportunity, as we've heard, to succeed no matter what your barriers are, to not allow the isms to impact us, but to make sure that we know no limits. I believe that there are no limits. Someone says, I can't, okay, I can. So there are no limits. So. As we carry forward the lessons learned and the inspiration gained, again, from these legacy of trailblazers, that is not confined only to a specific area, but is a timeless inspiration that transcends boundaries and propels us into a future where celebration of excellence is known to no limits. We thank you so much for being a part of this celebration. 
a testament to the enduring impact of black excellence in health and science. Until we meet again, let us, in the spirit of 60 years later, guide our endeavors toward a future marked with, again, excellence. At this time, we are finished with our program. Again, I just want to thank the panelists and for everyone that is here supporting. Let's give our panelists a, well, a round of applause.